Welcome to Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. The legislature's lame duck session kicked off with some drama or some theatrics, depending on your perspective. We'll talk about that and more with our panel of State House reporters, which today includes Sophie Nieto Munoz, reporter for NJ Monitor, Dustin Rassiopi, State House reporter for the Record USA Today Network, and Fred Snowflack, columnist for Insider NJ. We'll hear from them in just a bit, but we start today with the incoming Senate Minority Leader, Steve Araho. Senator, thanks for coming on with us. Good to see you, man. David, thank you very much. Good to be here. So uh, I, I want to start with a little videotape of some of the stuff that happened yesterday at the door to the assembly chamber. Let's take a look at that and then we'll come back and talk. You see this? See, see this, folks? Denying us entry into our house. This is America. This is America. An uh, illegal procedure, voting procedure they're relying on. It was deemed illegal and they're enforcing it. And this is tyranny, folks. America, see what's happening Putting here. Look at our heroes up here. See what's happening, America. They're not letting the minority party vote. Yeah, I think it's ridiculous. Look, here's the deal. They just quoted a policy that said it's a state house policy. Did you hear them say that? State house policy. Am I in the state house? Yeah. So what's the difference if I go 30 feet that way or I go 30 feet that way or that way? I don't understand. Nobody can understand. They're not going to physically restrain us. We can walk right past you. So there you have some of your assembly uh, colleagues, including the incoming minority leader in there, in a confrontation of sorts with state police. What was, what's your reaction to that? Well, first, David, thank you very much. And I, I think some of the issues obviously there is, is not just the vaccine policy, but it's access to the, the people's house, the state house. Um, it was a policy that was put in place by an unelected uh, uh, joint management commission uh, we filed a lawsuit uh, because it's, you know, it was an unauthorized um, policy. And as you heard from many people, the, um, the inconsistent application, first of all, you know, I know the media was detained from getting in uh, to see the proceedings as well. So that, David, that, I mean, that's the, that's the big issue. And for many, many months, as the cases of, you know, the, the virus have been going down, We've been at the state house uh, with public testimony, doing the people's business, and then all of a sudden now this is a new, uh, new policy by an, an unelected, uh, you know, committee. So we filed suit. Um, now before the, um, uh, you know, before the session, the uh, leaders in the uh, the Senate and the Assembly, uh, they they decided to make the decision themselves. Um, so therefore, and the court last night uh, did not dismiss. They said that uh, they, they they took up the uh, the uh, lawsuit that we had filed, but it has more to do than to, with just the uh, vac vaccine policy. It has to do with access to the state house. It also has to do with the the fact that the legislature needs to be more involved. And for 21 months, we've uh, the legislature has allowed one person to make all the rules, the mandates and, and executive orders. And let's face it, on November 2nd, the people, uh, the, the election, the people said they've had enough. They want their legislators to be more involved. Well, I mean, I'll get to that in a second, but it was a little dramatic, no, to, to see uh, one of the assembly members shouting tyranny. I mean, that's a pretty strong word. Uh, for what was basically a procedural misunderstanding or disagreement, no? Well, I, I think access to the state house is, a, is an important aspect because it is the people's house. But also, listen, they put the state police, and you know, I issued a statement as well. They put the state police in a very, um, you know, uncomfortable situation, um, yeah. and they deserve better than that. And th as I said, David, this has more to do with access and they would deny access they denied access to the media so the judge set a date for december 13th uh but now the speaker and the senate president 
have set their own rules. Do do they supersede the policy from the uh, State Capital Joint Management Commission? Well, the Joint Management Commission is is an unorth as completely unauthorized to make that decision. And the whole point was the legislature, uh, the, the presiding officers, uh, they certainly have the ability to make that decision. We firmly believe that the full legislature, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, should be involved in any kind of important rules changes like that. And we should debate them on the floor um, or debate them in some reasonable format instead of having just you know one, two, or three uh, people making the decisions on what is going to be uh, access to the state house. We all represent 40 districts. We all represent the same amount of roughly the same amount of people. And that, you know, on the Senate floor, or on the assembly floor, or in committee uh, meetings, that's where our constituents voices are heard. And I think that's, and that that's the main uh, point about this is that this should be access to the people's house and it was being denied. And it's also a lot of inconsistencies as well. Um, in how the policy, uh, you know, would, would be implemented. This is certainly not, um, you know, you mentioned what the, what the message the voters sent to all of you in both houses. Part of the message was get some work done, at least on the assembly side yesterday. They had, what, 40 or 50 bills up, and they got through seven. That's not a very good batting percentage. What's the public supposed to take away from that? Well, first of all, I mean, that, you'd have to talk to the people f from the assembly, but in the Senate, we actually, we went through our board list. Uh, we, we actually made, I, uh, Senator Testa, Senator Panaccio and, and myself, we made comments on the Senate floor regarding, regarding the policy. The Senate president uh, certainly allowed those comments and, and respected those comments. And you know, listen, in my comments, I said, I, I certainly hope that the legislature will take up its uh, responsibilities uh, more seriously and be a, a big part of, of the um, decisions going forward because we are a co-equal branch of government. And I certainly think that that's something that, you know, uh, we have to make sure continues to, to happen. And for 21 months, it hasn't. All right. Next time we see him, we're going to be calling him leader. He is the incoming Senate Minority Leader, Steve Araho. Senator, uh, good to see you. Thanks for coming by and have a great holiday. David, you too. Thank you very much. Great to see you. All right, let's bring in our panel now. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, Sophie, you were at the door during that confrontation. What, what was your takeaway of all of that? Um, it was definitely a very tense standoff for what was supposed to be kind of just a humdrum day in the State House. Um, we saw a lot of, we saw probably half a dozen uh, assemblymen stand up in front of the assembly chamber, chambers, try to get in uh, without showing their vaccine card or their negative test. And we just saw the video. I mean, it, it was a complete standoff. Um, there was a lot of yelling, a lot of tension, and then eventually they were let in. Um, reporters still weren't let in and it caused this drama that delayed the session for over two hours and then they only got to seven um, legis uh, legis pieces of legislation, basically. Right. So it, it was a very tense day and I think that, you know, the upcoming sessions are, are it really comes down to what the court decides, uh, I think, is, is how we're going to see the future of these sessions play out. Fred, what did you think of what you saw? Well, I think we've seen this. I mean, we've seen this in, in Congress, too. I mean, look, Republicans want to make a political point. To be perfectly honest, it's not very hard. They're being asked to show a vaccine card, which is not not exactly an onerous obligation. It takes you just show, the, show your card and get in. But I think they want to make a political spectacle out of it. I mean, they have the right to do that. And I'm sure the Republican base, the conservative base is going to say, Hip, hip, hooray, they're going to be all, all for them. But I mean, I have spoken to some Republican assembly people privately who did not go along with this, who do not want to go along with this, and they said it was kind of juvenile because the main idea is you are supposed to get something done. And nothing really was done in the assembly yesterday. I previously mentioned seven bills. Were, I mean, only, there's only action on seven bills. I mean, and the bill list is much longer than that. But I mean, you know, there's there's more attention, you get more attention when you 
talk about liberty disappearing in tyranny, and that's just rhetoric. Yeah. But Dustin, in terms of the bills that did get passed, uh, what, what was of significance out of that handful of bills? The, uh, the child, expanding the child tax credit, that was, that was the big one. That was the one that the speaker cited as probably the most in, important. Um, probably the most consequential legislation that's going to come up in lame duck didn't come up yesterday. So all things considered, yesterday was the best uh, day for the Republicans to do their thing. Um, and like Sophie said, I mean, we'll see what the judge says uh, and what that may mean for future standoffs um, over the next, what, six weeks that we have left in this session. Yeah. The speaker had some really harsh words uh, for Republicans, which you don't generally see a lot. Let's hear what the speaker had to say from the podium uh, this week, and then we'll come back. In the midst of this sacrifice, the only thing that was asked of the legislators here today to do was to show that they weren't infected, to care about their colleagues and the people in the chamber. I'm outraged that the, in the midst of this sacrifice, 28 members of the minority caucus could not be bothered to exhibit the common decency and humanity, all because they would rather have a couple of minutes on TV news or point to stand for some political theater. I'm more outraged that this is happening in the midst of a new variant of the virus in, on our shores, and more outraged still that this is happening uh, when we know very little about what will come in the future. You know, for, for Craig Coughlin, that's pretty fiery, I guess. Um, there's a court challenge, of course, so we have to wait and see what happens with that, but uh, was Coughlin just uh, letting off some steam, or are there now some damaged relationships, Fred? Well, well, apparently he was outraged. He said that three times. I mean, our politicians yes. are always outraged about something or another. So you got to take that with a grain of salt. But I mean, I think, I think, no, I think it was just letting off steam. I mean, but what he did say, other than being outraged, other than saying he was outraged three times, is I think it was something that does make sense. He said all they were being asked to do was show a card. I mean, that's not, as I said before, that's not really a difficult thing to do. But I mean, as far as relations further down the road, I don't think this will make that much of a difference. I think it will maybe at least may, may blow over eventually. Just in terms of the impact of, of yesterday's events, Dustin, you agree with Fred that that's just Thursday in Trenton? <laughs> Yeah, I can feel the outrage just coming off that piece of paper that the speaker was reading off of. <laughs> the and I don't know if it would, if it has any effect on relationships with Republicans because Republicans really don't get anything done because they're the minority party. If right. there's a significant piece of legislation that has meaning, I'm sure it'll make its way to the floor for a vote. The thing that I I guess causes a little bit of concern thinking ahead is you know, what does this mean in the future if the legislature wants to um, repeal that religious vaccine exemption like they tried a couple of years ago? Given the climate that we're in and after what Republicans did defying the state police and then the state police being in the position that they were just kind of let them do whatever they wanted. What happens if we try to repeal that religious exemption? The legislature tries to do that. And what message do people in the public get when they descend on the state house? Are they going to storm try to storm past state police troopers? Um, it's just, and with all the overheated rhetoric about tyranny and, and all that, um, it just seems in this particular climate, we're less than a year removed from the January 6th Capitol riot. It, it seems like it's a, it's a little bit of a dangerous game to be playing uh, by the Republicans to go as far as they did yesterday. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I got the feeling uh, of that yesterday. Clearly, these two events were, you know, worlds apart in terms of the severity and the threat that they posed. But you're right about a lot of that rhetoric. Um, and what happens when, you know, not five uh, lawmakers, but 50 protesters of one kind or another, or 100? I mean, we saw during that vaccination anti-vaccination rally, um, that there were thousands of people out there who 
had they wanted to, could have really stormed that building, no, Fred? Oh, absolutely, they could have stormed that building if they wanted to, yes, yes. I mean, I think it's not, that's not something the state police are probably prepared for. Maybe they should, but realistically, I mean, if you have a thousand people, even 500 people running through the door, like just running through the mag magnetometers, I mean, no one's going to stop them. Yeah, that's just yeah. that's just the reality. Yeah, yes. In the end, in just in terms of public perception, who won yesterday, uh, this week, Sophie? That's a great question. Um, who won this week? I guess the Democrats who were able to pass their pieces of legislation and, um, you know, actually get some work done. But at the same time, you know, we saw a lot of the. Uh, louder people on Twitter were definitely applauding the Republicans for standing up for what they believe is right. So, you know, I think they might have won if they are trying to pander a bit to that crowd of people. Yeah, Dustin, I guess if you're a party that can't move any legislation, you've got to get some rhetorical victories. Did the Republicans succeed in that regard? Definitely. They, I mean, they got exactly what they wanted. They got all the, the news camera and newspaper attention. Um, they got the outrage from the speaker. Um, and they, in a way, fulfilled their obligation in, as the minority party to be the opposition party and to challenge the, uh, the other party, the Democrats. And they, they played a game of chicken and the Republicans won because the state police were in this really undefined um, gray area where they couldn't, they were there to enforce, but not really enforce the rules. So, you know, you had some people like some of them, Brian Bergen saying, well, you can't do anything. So what are you going to do if I walk right by you? Um, so uh, I, I think the Republicans got everything that they wanted, plus maybe a little bit more. Fred, would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. I mean, a lot of people don't follow the what legislation, what gets passed that closely, but people are seeing Republicans sort of being kept out of the quote unquote people's house and, and, and they're talking about tyranny. I think that definitely appeals to their base. I mean, that's sort of a rallying cry. Did we hear so anything? That, from... that... Go ahead, Fred. No, I think from that vantage point, they did win, if you want to look at it in those terms. Did we hear anything from the administration, uh, Sophie, about their outrage at what happened or what? Anything? Um, I personally did not hear anything from the Murphy campaign. I'm not sure if anyone They're else They were kind of quiet. Yeah. Um, you guys hear anything from the surprising. administration? No, Fred only what Dustin? Murphy said at his, I mean, he said that when this came up at his press briefing, that was on Monday. That was four days ago, he kind of defended the rule as it was. And he, I think he said something, if you if you don't have a card, you could take that rapid test. He said it's only 20 seconds, 10 seconds in each nostril. So that, that's basically the extent of what he had said. All right, let me get to a couple of uh, news bits here from stuff that you guys have been working on. Sophie, you had a, uh, an excellent piece on how uh, some folks were excluded from the state's uh, uh, fund um, what happened there and, and has it been fixed? So, right, the Excluded Workers Fund for New yes, Jerseyans. Yes, sorry, the Excluded didn't, Workers Fund. That's okay. Um, that uh, New Jerseyans who didn't receive any stimulus checks or unemployment benefits are eligible to collect up to $2,000 from that fund. Um, so that's really for undocumented people, people who are here on visas um, and lost income during the pandemic. So that application has proved to be very confusing um, to these communities. About 6,000 people have applied, and of those, only 400 have been accepted. All the other 5,000 or so um, are missing documents are still being processed. So there's a few things that make it confusing because you have, the state is not overseeing the application process. These six advocacy organizations are. So they have no way to connect back to the state and get help for the people that they serve. Um, and then at the same time, you have a community 
that is vulnerable, that is fearful of government, that doesn't typically ask for help when they need it. And they're seeing all these bumps in the road that is for a program that's set up for them. And then because they can't access it, they're just not even applying anymore. And they're just giving up, unfortunately. And, and has, has anything changed since your report on this? No, I haven't seen anything change um, other than more applications have been filed. I haven't gotten the latest numbers from uh, Department of Human Services just yet. We don't know how many more have been accepted. And as far as I know, no money has been distributed yet either. So we're still uh, asking those questions to figure out what, what needs to be fixed for this to work. Fred Snowflack, you ran into Jack Cittarelli? Yes, I did. I, I went to, the, this is a holiday party of the Morris County Republicans this week. These parties always go to, it's great to pick up gossip and especially when politicians have had a few drinks. But anyway, Jack Cittarelli, he was sort of the guest speaker, the surprise guest. And of course, he was treated like a conquering hero. And what he said was that, he actually made a legitimate point. He said, a lot of people come up to me and they say, how sorry they are that I came so close, but I lost. And he said he he was getting annoyed. I'm, I'm sure he's not really annoyed, but he's just saying that he's quote unquote getting annoyed at that because he's spinning it or at least he's saying is that, hey, we Republicans had a great election. I only lost by 80,000 votes, but we made gains in the legislature and more significantly since everybody looks ahead, he thinks, and he said this at that gathering that next year, 2022, is going to be a good year for Republicans. He's talking about hoping that the party could win win back, quote unquote, three or four congressional seats that they lost in 2018. That remains to be uh -huh. seen, but that's kind of the optimism that Republicans have at the moment. So it's Jack's party now. Dustin, you wrote recently about how abortion was set to become a real wedge issue in the state. Now that Mississippi case uh, made it clear that that is going to be the case. Uh, what's the landscape on that issue right now, based on what we heard from the Supreme Court this week? Well, uh, the Supreme Court, it, because it's a conservative majority and based on the arguments this week, it sounds like uh, they are going to uphold that state ban in Mississippi, possibly fully overturn Roe v. Wade, although that seems less likely. But if that's the case, then you know, it's up to states. Um, and New Jersey has some legal protections in place based on prior court rulings, but it, it isn't actually codified into law. And that's what Phil Murphy, uh, Governor Murphy wants. Uh, he wants that on his desk before lame duck ends, uh, preferably sooner. But interestingly enough, this is a dispute between Democrats and that's the party who fully supports Roe v. Wade. But in Trenton, they're disputing some of the particulars of that bill because uh, it in many ways uh, goes well beyond uh, the, simply the protections of a woman's right. right to have an abortion. We have six weeks to figure out between the Democrats what they wanna do, but it seems probably likely that at the very least, they'll get that Roe versus Wade uh, decision enshrined into law. All right, certainly gonna keep our eye on that. That's Reporters Roundtable for this week, but I wanna take a minute to share a thought or two on some of the events of this week. After Republican Assembly members were allowed back into the chambers, state police attempted to restrict press from the proceedings. After some pushback from reporters and an hour's worth of time, the troopers eventually stepped aside. But this is not the first time either state police or other state house security have felt it within their authority to restrict the press from the center of the people's business. As important as lawmakers are to the governmental process, so is the press. In other words, if you're in the room and in session, we need to be in the room too. While the assembly speaker and Senate president are modifying the rules, they may want to clarify to one and all that abridging the freedom of the press is, as we like to say around here, not cool, not to mention unconstitutional. Thanks to Senator Oraho and our panel, Sophie, Dustin, and Fred. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay, and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more Chatbox, NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler, and NJ Spotlight News 
with Brianna Venosi. For the entire crew over here, I'm David Cruz. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com. Promotional support is provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. <laughs> Thank you.